dear listeners, and welcome to another episode of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I'm your host, Jason Johnston Yellen, formerly known as the White Walker, more recently known as the Whiskey Wizard. Thank you to Andrew Miller, the champagne of people for that one. And I'm joined today, and as always, which is a line you might be familiar with from One Nation Under Whiskey, with my very good friend, dear, dear friend, the whiskey cherub himself, Joshua Hatton. Uh, Hello, Joshua. Hi, Jason. How are you on this fine, crisp Monday morning? Oh, wait. Yeah, I'm all right. Oh, it's it's Wednesday, right. isn't it, for our listeners? How are you on this fine Wednesday? Well, the good news is we have to record it in the past so that you can edit it and release it in the present. That. So I think it's okay for us to be here on a Monday and for this to go live on a Wednesday. Fair, fair. Okay. If you're listening in for the first time, Joshua and I bring a new story to the attention of the other. We read it over the course of the first half of the episode. We riff on it over the course of the second half of the episode. And we try to get out of here with a tight 30, sometimes a tight 35. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. And I'm talking minutes. Oh, yeah. What else could it be? How about this for you, Joshua? Joshua. Dated December 1 of 2020, today is the CBMTRA Day of Action. You want to hear more? O-I-C-U-R-M-T. <laughs> I-C-U-P. <laughs> Please, Jason. I, I... One of my kids love that one. My kids love really? that one. Yeah. What, what, what is this... What do what these Yahtzee letters stand for? I subscribe to the ADI email. Mm -hmm. And so ADI is the American Distilling Institute. And the other week, on December 1st, they sent out an email mm -hmm. that was entitled, Today is the CBMTRA Day of Action. And it was it was then quite interesting because over the course of December one. If you were looking at any distillers or brewers, I don't know if you or I follow any winemakers, but brewers and distillers mm -hmm. on the social medias were, were posting some, some key language mm -hmm. that was repeated uh, in multiple places, in multiple ways by multiple people. And so to, to put some leaves on these branches, the the CBMTRA is the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act. And I'll I'll give you a, a quick paragraph out of the ADI email that I received, and then I've got a Forbes story from December 1 mm. that does a nice job of, of talking about this issue. Okay. Go ahead. So ADI say to their members, this is urgently important as the current federal excise tax known as FET for beverage alcohol producers will expire on December 31st 2020 meaning that craft beverage alcohol producers will face a devastating 400% tax increase in 2021 <laughs> Without congressional action mm -hmm. to hashtag stop craft tax increases mm -hmm. before the end of the year, many craft beverage alcohol producers may not be able to keep their doors open in 2021. Now, obviously, we've lived through COVID mm -hmm. in 2020. Mm -hmm. We have lived through, you know, really the, the demise of of a large portion of the hospitality sector yeah. in 2020. And now here we have producers who have just been beaten around the face and head for, for a year, now coming up against this potential 400% tax increase. I do want to say that this was also a huge deal this time last year. And it was the exact same conditions. They needed a, a stay of execution, if you will. And by the close of the year, they were given that stay. However, it was only good for one year. And it seemed like such a, a large, important, pressing issue 
they're only kicking the can one year down the road Mm -hmm. looked like it would be problematic to begin with. If you then look at we've had an election year, we've clearly had a lot of fallout post-election where things have been murky. You've then got COVID relief bills. You've then got Congress taking you know, vacations away from a COVID relief bill. And now you've got craft producers saying, hey, there's something else that needs your immediate attention. I'm worried for them that I don't know if they're going to get eyes on this. What have you and I talked about through the year as well? Our own 25% tariffs. Who, where are the adults in the room? Yeah. Who's looking at these things and saying, these are punitive and, and they really don't need to be? Yeah. Is, is this story just too small given everything else that's going on? Is it a place for legislators to look for revenue to pay for COVID relief bills, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting and scary. Is there, now, that was the ADI part of it was there was correct that was just yeah. that was just one portion yeah and yeah. i just i want to say this actually because there is a portion where the adi are, are talking to their members about emails to consumers or a general audience about you know why this matters and so i'll just give you this full section and then we'll go into the forbes piece last year Congress passed a one-year extension of the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act, CBMTRA. Uh, CBMTRA is important to our business as it extends a federal excise tax reduction for craft beverage alcohol producers like us. This allows, and you're to insert your, your business name here, this allows us to make critical investments back into our business. For example, buying more grain from farmers, purchasing more equipment from manufacturers, providing new job opportunities, giving back to our community, continuing to make great products for consumers like you to responsibly enjoy. And then one more paragraph here. However, this one-year extension expires on December 31st, 2020. If Congress doesn't act before then, craft beverage alcohol producers across the nation will face a 400% tax increase. We are already hurting economically due to COVID-19 and a 400% tax increase would be devastating to many businesses like ours. Yeah. So so that was one example of, of stock you know, communication Mm -hmm. so that you're sending out a consistent message to put this, you know, to get consumers. What have we talked about the 25% tariffs? Get consumers to run up the flagpole, to tell their representatives, Mm -hmm. hey, listen to these people over here. Listen to these producers. Listen, Listen to these people who are producers within our own state, you know, that idea of a, of a grassroots. But yeah. they also have, have language for suppliers. They also have language for social media. And, and that's what I was talking about earlier on in the podcast. So they, they really tried to, to, to get this blast out there, right, on December 1, mm-hmm. which is a little nerve-wracking because you're only 30 days from this, actually. <laughs> and I, you last, know, last you know, I, going into effect for 2021. And last I checked, there's... I think there's a, a fairly big holiday coming up later this month, and I th- I could be wrong, but I think a lot of legislators may be taking off time in, in honor of, of such a holiday. So do we really have yeah. 30 days? We, we don't. Wow. Well, and, and on the back of, and on the back of a, a Thanksgiving recess as well. Right, you got to come back into your office to catch up on the stuff you missed while you were away. While this is now falling on your desk, hopefully for your attention. So, I've been I've been promising a Forbes article. Mm-hmm. We have one from Joseph V. McAuliffe, M I C A L L E F. Joseph V. McAuliffe, who covers spirits for Forbes, and the title is "How Impending Federal Tax Hikes Will Decimate the Craft Distillery Industry." Mm-hmm. And he begins. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit craft distillers exceptionally hard. Unlike the established national spirits brands, 
most craft distillers lack a broad retail distribution network. On average, the typical craft distiller relies on tasting room sales, both consumed on-premise and off, for about half of their revenues. Lockdown orders imposed by states have decimated those sales, leaving many craft distillers on perilous economic ground. And here we go. To add further insult to injury, a key tax provision is set to expire by the end of the year. The result would be a five-fold increase in the excise tax that the federal government levies on alcohol produced by craft distillers. And here we get a quote from Chris Swanger, who is the president and CEO of what we know as Discus. Discus is the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a one paragraph quote. 2020 has been such a stressful year for craft distillers with the devastating impact of the pandemic, the retaliatory tariffs, and now a looming massive federal tax hike. The countdown is on. If we don't get the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act passed by the end of the year, I fear this may be the final blow for many small craft distilleries. That is then followed with a quote from Eric Zandona, who is the Director of Spirits Information at the American Distilling Institute, the same ADI from whom I was quoting their email. Perfect. And Eric Zandona says, and again, it's another paragraph, a survey on the impacts of COVID-19 on craft distillers found that 43% of employees had been furloughed and two thirds of respondents did not believe they could sustain their businesses for more than six months. COVID-19 has been hard on craft distillers. In addition to the loss of sales and the need to lay off employees, we have seen some distilleries go out of business already and some have lost as much as 60% of their normal revenue during the pandemic. Mm. So you can hear very clearly there, their members are under pressure, yeah. under significant pressure. And if I recall earlier in the year, when you and I did a One Nation Under Whiskey, where we did a, a quick survey of some different industry folk and how the early days of the pandemic were affecting them. And we spoke to Scott Harris at Catoctin Creek Distilling mm -hmm. Company in Purcellville in Northern Virginia. And, and he was talking about their attempts to pivot to online sales. They were trying to find online sales that would allow them to fill in some of these you know, missing revenues yeah, sure. from from having to shut down their tasting room, having foot traffic, you know, passing through the tasting room. So we understand, we've heard it firsthand that 2020 has been an incredibly trying year. It seems like a no brainer to sign off on this on this act, maybe for longer than another year, right? Maybe say, let's kick the can a couple of years and let's try to work on it in the meantime, but let's protect ourselves for a couple of years, not just protect ourselves for 12 months. Yeah. I, when we're having an administration change. Right, and, and it, seems, it seems obvious. However, this is one of how many countless industries that have been negatively affected by the economic downturn, by COVID, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's only so much money to be going around to help these industries. Yeah. How do these yeah. guys win favor over hospitality, over airline, over, you know, insert industry here? Well, and if you if you think about the, the, the you know, many people don't want to line up for a handout, and instead of them having to fill out paperwork to apply for a government loan, they're instead saying, how about you just don't charge us for that thing? Mm. Right? How about you just <laughs> yeah. leave that off for another year? You, yeah. There's no more paperwork to be done here. Yeah. Extend this for another 12 months, maybe 24 months, and we move on, right? We're on to the next thing. So the, the Forbes article continues here. Right. And, and I want to include this portion because I like the quotes, but... 
the author here starts to put some leaves on our branches and starts to tie some things back in for us here. So the CBME, the Craft Beverage Modernization Act, which was passed as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, mm -hmm. reduced the federal excise tax on alcohol on a producer's first 100,000 proof gallons from 13.50 to $2.70. Mm. This was the first reduction in federal excise tax since the Civil War. The tax reduction was a godsend to craft distillers, many of which are still in the process of getting established. Sure. 100,000 proof gallons is the equivalent of about 1.2 million bottles of alcohol at an ABV of 40%. You're looking at me, okay? <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm doing math in my head, which can be very dangerous. But as you're you're rattling these numbers off, I'm thinking that seems like a lot. It seems like almost too much. But we'll talk about that in the second half. I think. I want to make sure I have my All math right. right. Okay, we'll pivot. Yeah. Okay, you ch you check your math yeah, when the break yeah. comes along. Production between 100,000 proof gallons and 22.1 million proof gallons was taxed at $13.34 per proof gallon, while any higher production levels were taxed at the old rate of $13.50 per proof gallon. Mm. In addition, the CBME allowed the transfer of spirits between bonded premises in both bulk and bottled form. Previously, only bulk spirits could be transferred in this way. I didn't actually even know about the bottled portion of that. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've only moved bulk in totes. The original CBMA had authorised a permanent reduction in the FET, the federal excise tax. That reduction was later capped at two years as part of the legislative compromises le that led to the passage of the TCJA, quickly scrolls through notes. Oh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Thank you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Guess a little bit governmental up in here, doesn't it? Just a wee bit. Uh, now, that reduction, that reduction is slated to expire at the end of this year. Because the tax is imposed on the amount of alcohol in a bottle and not on the bottle's retail selling price, it has a bigger impact on low-priced spirits than on expensive ones. I'm guessing the idea is on an expensive one, you can just tuck away that extra $10 or that extra $10 plus margin, plus margin, plus margin. Whereas yeah. if you're trying to get something on the shelf for 12 bucks, you're not hitting your, your yeah, numbers if, on yeah, that. If you, if, if you have a bottle that should be 30 but is now 40 as compared to a bottle that should be 1,000 but is now 1,010, yes, it... it <laughs> Yeah, okay, gotcha. <laughs> a slight, slight difference. We'll pivot back to that in the second half okay. as well. Alcoholic beverages are among the most heavily taxed items in the US. On balance, roughly $2 of every $3 in retail spirit sales goes to local, state, or the federal government hmm. in various excise taxes, income taxes, and fees. And then we just have a, a, a couple of quotes here and then we're close to getting out of here. Tom Potter is the president of New York Distilling Company in Brooklyn. He underscored the urgency of congressional action, noting, we are waiting with growing dread to learn if our excise taxes will soon quintuple overnight on January 1. Expiration of the current tax rates would be flat devastating to us and would come at the worst possible time. The increase in taxes would equate to one third of our entire payroll. Wow. It's hard to understand how a proposal with such overwhelming bipartisan support could be left hanging this way. We're begging Congress to renew it. And then uh, we have another uh, distiller here. We've got Jeff Quint, the founder CEO of Cedar Ridge Distillery in Swisher, Iowa. Hmm. Another paragraph quote here. 
For hundreds of craft distillers across this country, there is no matter more urgent than getting the spirits federal excise tax reduction extended or better yet made permanent. Yes. That's what you and I were just discussing, mm -hmm. Joshua. Mm -hmm. Reducing the tax was huge for small craft distilleries. It has enabled us to grow, adding thousands of new jobs here in the US. Being forced to revert back to the higher tax will likely erase all these job gains we've created over the last few years. Mm. Okay, now hold on to your hat because we're going to get out of here with a whole bunch of words and I'll do my best to, to read them as clearly as possible. The CBM TRA Coalition, a group of beverage alcohol trade associations including the Beer Institute, Brewers Association, Distilled Spirits Council of the United States, American Craft Spirits Association, American Distilled Spirits Alliance, Wine Institute, Wine America, the United States Association of Cider Makers, and American Mead Makers Association, yes. is sponsoring a campaign to urge Congress to vote for the reduction in excise taxes mandated by the CBMTRA. They are urging Americans to contact their representatives and senators to urge them to vote for the CBMTRA and to make the tax reductions in the federal taxes on alcohol permanent. Mm. There you go. And if you're not sure who to contact, dear listener, you can find your representative and senators along with contact information on the Who Is My Representative website. The CBM TRA Coalition also has a website that will automatically forward your message in support for the passage of the CBM TRA to your elected officials. And one thing that you and I like, Joshua, about our dear listeners when listening to Extra Extra is they have been known to reach out and say, yeah, they have. really appreciate yeah. learning about this, yeah. really appreciated all the information. What can we actually do? Well, there you go. Google search CBMTRA Coalition. You'll find their website on that website. You can make a message and they will make sure it gets to your elected officials. And we will be sure to, to put a link in our Facebook page and in both the One Nation Under Whiskey page and the Single Cast Nation page when this goes live so absolutely so we're running a little bit behind our tight 30 but we did have a little bit of chat along the way here's a little intermission and we'll be back on the second half to chitty chat among ourselves one thing I want to clear up is we left you with a math problem on your hands. <laughs> did you did you run the math on 100,000 proof gallons at 40% ABV? I did. I did. So just so our listeners are aware, you and I have a bunch of different mat matrices that help us figure out what our overall costs are going to be based on you know the cost of a cask, how many liters are in that cask, what the ABV is, our bottling costs, federal excise tax, you know all, all this thing, all these things and then and that's for overseas spirits and for our US spirits, we have a separate matrix which is one specific to proof gallons. And so what this matrix does is it takes the number of proof gallons along with the proof, really hurts me to say that word, and then it converts that into how many liters overall, and then based on bottle size, how many bottles you would get. So if I take that 100,000 proof gallons and, and I base mm -hmm. this on 80 proof or 40% alcohol for people who prefer the ABV rather than the proof, based, mm -hmm. based on those two numbers... Rather than, what did the article say? 1.2 million bottles? It did. So this is, this is why I find it a bit troubling. According to our matrix, which has only provided us spot-on numbers in the past, 
I don't think I've made any changes to this. It would be 1.2 million if these were 375 bottles, right? 375 milliliter, but 750 milliliter should be about 600, if you want to be very exact, 630,907 750 milliliter bottles. So the the conversation that, that you and I were having previously, mm-hmm. before we hit the record button, is does a craft producer have a hundred thousand proof gallons or or these ballpark six hundred thousand seventy five CL bottles? Mm. Do they have that annually with this reduction in federal excise tax? Or from the day you open your doors, does it start ticking until the point at which you send out your ballpark 600,000th bottle? And given what we're talking about here, and given you know the, the craft distillers who seem to be affected by this decision, mm-hmm. it strikes me that it's a from the opening of the doors. But... Who's then keeping track of that year upon year? And on top of that, where it puts in, there's this range. You know, production between 100,000 proof gallons and 22.1 million proof gallons was taxed at 1334 Mm. per per proof gallon. Like once you pass 100,000, you're now just on your way to 22.1 million that's a long way to go. You know, when, when, you know, when do you think Scott and Becky uh, will put out? You know, <laughs> I'm trying to convert this in my head. If that's 600,000 and that's 10, 20 times that, <laughs> that's, that's millions upon millions yeah, upon millions was, upon yeah. millions upon millions of bottles, or as we call it, just a good year for Jack Daniels. <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, it, it, the, that's the thing that's always struck me about craft distillers coming into the game. And even with the, the CBMA in place here, mm. is that that 100,000 proof gallon seems like a nice runway. But there's not much to protect you from a Jack Daniels of the world, right? But- you, you become very similar to them. After 600,000 bottles, which, you know, could take you a little bit of time to get there. But that's where you're heading. Yeah. Well, I, you're not you're not moving into a second tier. And I hate using the term tier because I feel like lockdown and COVID has ruined tiers for everybody. <laughs> but, you know, and moving into a second tier there, you'd at least say, well, now I'm, you know, uh, a mid-level craft distiller, yeah. you know, or I'm, or I'm a you know secondary size craft distiller. Like you'd at least have some tiers to go through where you might get some breaks that would allow you to keep building your business and hiring on people. You, you think it would make sense, seeing as individually, right? Personal taxes. There are different bracketed systems where if you make between X and Y. This is your tax bracket. If you make between Y and Z, well, now this is your tax bracket. Yeah, it seems to be there. You're going from zero to sixty really fast. The good news is, six hundred thousand bottles per year is a heck of a lot of bottles for small producers. And I could be wrong here, but I I wouldn't necessarily say that. You know, your your average craft producer is looking at Jack Daniels as competition. That's that's not oh, right. That's uh, absolutely yeah. not. I was just using it for numbers. Yeah. So if they were to lock this these taxes in place, in other words, lock it in place where it's not being increased back to the four times the amount that it currently is, and you leave it at okay, if you produce up to six hundred thousand bottles per year you could be taxed at this structure. I think that that potentially protects a lot of small producers. At the same time, though, it can put a governor on them as well. So, you know, if Catoctin Creek starts to grow and grow and grow, 
or Westland or Copperworks or, you know, you insert distillery here, you could have yep. this big, this big nut to crack, right? This big speed bump to get past. But with the right investment mm-hmm. and the right packaging, that, that definitely is a possibility. But I would say at the very least, this, you know, 600,000 bottles or 100,000 proof gallons gives uh gives these producers a, a good amount of leeway yeah i'm i'm just looking at this it's as i'm reading over it it's making so much sense if if you're the united states government mm-hmm. the federal government and you want to help small businesses and job creators within states, which I think is such an important aspect that we often overlook here, where craft distilling isn't a monolith, right? It's 50 distinct states Mm -hmm. with 50 distinct, obviously, as we've discussed previously, sets of laws Mm -hmm. um, that you're trying to overcome in numerous different ways. But you're, as it said in the ADI email, right, you're buying from farmers. You're buying from industrial companies, right? You're buying industrial components, you know, bottling lines, uh, forklifts. Mm-hmm. Um, you're putting money back into the economy. Why would we not want stronger craft distillers in our states that are able to put, you know, money and jobs yeah. and opportunities back into those same states? Why would we hang them out to dry here Mm. and say, you know, as was quoted earlier, you know, yeah, it might look one way on December 31. It's going to look a very different way on January 1. Yeah. Like that's that's cruel and unusual punishment when you're trying to make your plans for next year. I agree with you. However, I believe taxes are very, very important, especially when used and applied properly. And so while I, I I do not like the idea of of you know January one all of a sudden your your taxes in, increase fivefold, I do like the idea of, yeah, maybe you do kick this down down the road another year until we can or two years or what have you, until we can get to a place where you can figure out the correct tax structure that allows for tiers or brackets that would help, whether it's on a federal level or on a state level, people manage tax revenue a bit better, right? We're, we're in. Let me let yeah. me just add this really quickly. Yeah. Our country is currently fucked, fucked beyond belief, and. Both legislators on on the left and legislators on the right are fighting to figure out COVID relief plans, rent relief plans, restaurant relief plans. Insert your industry relief plans here, and that's got to come from taxes somewhere. It's It's got to come from somewhere. We can't just print money because then that lowers the value of our dollar. So taxes are really important. And we just – we need to get to a place where we're just not hemorrhaging, where people can come together and say, okay, let, let's sort this. Let's let's figure this out so that it's fair for all. Well, and just as you as you mentioned the, the mighty dollar bill there, and I want to get us out of here on this, is if you're walking into your retail store – or you're looking online if your if your state allows that with your liquor stores, and you're asking yourself, do I want to spend twenty or thirty dollars on this known brand of bourbon or rye, mm. or do I want to spend sixty dollars on this local brand of bourbon or rye? It's very easy to say, well, my money only goes so mm-hmm. far. And I'm going to walk out of here with this well-known brand at this affordable price. Sure. There's a reason the pricing is the pricing. And I think, again, if we want to have a strong craft distilling market industry, 
across this country and across 50 states, there do there there will need to be breaks in place that allow craft distillers to pay living wages in their states and in their communities, but they can also be competitive on shelves so that there is more chance of a consumer taking a chance on a, a locally produced item. So, yeah. you know, I agree with you. Yep, tax revenue needs to be made. Yes, we need to have taxes to pay for a bunch of other things. Are we getting them from the right place? That's a very good point. Yep. Be something we leave open here. Yep. That is fair. So Joshua, I'm 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 very cognizant of the clock on the wall here. We we did I'm really happy that we could do our part to bring attention to this because I think it is hugely important that consumers are aware of this, that the representatives are aware of this, that something gets put in place by December 31. And as we mentioned in the first half, look at the link that we've put uh, you know, up, up with this episode. Get yourself along to the CBMTRA Coalition website and have your voice heard. That's how democracy works. Yeah. Until next time, dear listeners, until next time, Joshua Hatton, I'm Jason Johnston Yellen, and we're out of here, dude. We Cheers. are. Cheers. Cheers.